Welcome to Final Night, powered by EnterTalk Radio, the groove of the music industry. I'm your host, John Robinson, coming to you live from Vinyl Night Studios in beautiful Thousand Oaks, California. This show features some of the best and most influential people in the music industry. Each week, I will feature an intimate, candid, and in-depth one-on-one with all the musicians, recording engineers, singers, and producers that have changed the world. Before we get started, I'd like to give a big shout-out to my sponsors, DW Drums, Peisty Cymbals, Remo Drumheads, Regal Tip Drumsticks and Brushes, Blue Microphones, Zoom Cameras, LP Percussion, Roland, Oralex, and Source Connect. You can also download the Intertalk Radio app on your iPhone and Android whenever you're on the go. Lou Marini is one of the most sought-after session horn players on saxophone, flute, and clarinet, solo artist, arranger, and composer. He has electrified audiences and sounds in jazz, rock, blues, classical music, and film and television. He's been a member of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, the Saturday Night Live band from 1975 to 83, the Blues Brothers band, and in credits include hundreds of albums including Eric Clapton, Aretha Franklin, Tony Bennett, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, Lou Reed, Frank Zappa, Aerosmith, The Stones, The Band, Steely Dan, Dion Warwick, Maureen McGovern, Diodato, James Taylor, Aerosmith, big bands such as Buddy Rich, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, and the Woody Herman Orchestra, just to name a few. Lewis contributed both to playing and writing on films such as The Ref, Hair, The Wiz, Bright Lights, Big City, True Colors, Bye Bye Birdie, and Turner and Hooch. In 2010, Lou was named Artistic Director at the first Brianza Blues Festival in Monza, Italy. Lou attended North Texas State University College of Music, where he played in the One O'Clock Lav Band. Marini has spent most of his professional life working as a sideman and arranger, but his first record in 2001 with Ray Reach and the Magic City Orchestra came out, titled Lou's Blues. In 2010, his second record released Blue Lou and the Mishi Project with Mishi Siegel, and his last record called Star Maker in 2012. Lou Marini is an accomplished artist, actor, arranger, composer. He's fluent in jazz and rock, blues and classical, with a command of soprano, alto, tenor sax, flute, piccolo, alto flute, and clarinet. He is truly one of the industry's most prolific artists of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, Blue Lou Marini. Welcome to Vinyl Night. Well, wow. That sounds pretty amazing, man. Who the hell were you talking about? Well, <laughs> shit, you, you did it. Yeah, well, that's that's what happens when you live long enough, John. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh you God, were playing hip pickles. Uh, yeah, it, it, that's when when I uh, when I was in college at North Texas. Or it was, uh, I think, it was around 1969 or, or something. Right before I moved to New York, uh, I heard Cream in person, and. Uh, I, I was just amazed at the, at the amount of sound that they got, you know. And so Hit Pickles right. was was uh, sort of born of that idea of, like, trying to get a big band to to generate the kind of power. But it's basically just, uh, you know, the, the orchestration is as if it's just guitar, bass, and drums, sort of. And uh, and then uh, the story of the title, my, my lifelong best friend Joe Randazzo, a great bass trombone player here in New York. Uh, he came from New York, and, and when we were living together in Texas, his mom used to send him uh, Italian delicatessen care packages from New York, you know, and uh, one right. night we were hanging out listening to music, and uh, I, I went to the refrigerator in the kitchen to get something, and when I did, I broke a bottle of pickles. It wasn't the pickles <laughs> that his mom sent, though. And he heard the sound, you know, he heard the sound breaking. And, and he yelled out from the other room. He's got this funny high Italian voice. He goes, what was that? You know? And I <laughs> said, oh, it was, it was uh, don't worry about it. It was just a jar of pickles. And he goes, not the hip pickles. <laughs> you know? And the idea that, that pickles could be hip, that sort of, uh, that was right when I wrote the tune. So that was, it was a no-brainer. It had to be hip pickles. <laughs> That's fantastic, man. I, I love that song, man. Thanks. Thanks. Well, yeah. you, you were uh, born as a Southerner, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I was born in Charleston. My my dad was uh, 
playing saxophone and arranging in the Navy band in Charleston during the war. And, uh, and he met my mom, uh, who was from North Carolina, and down there she was working in an officer's club that the band used to play in. And uh, so they got married, and, and uh, then uh, so I was born in the Charleston Navy Yard Hospital, I think. And uh, but but we then they, they moved back to Ohio and then back down to Georgia for a couple of years. But most of my childhood was spent in the same small town in Ohio, a little town called Beach City, where my dad was right. uh, the high school band director and my first teacher. And he did something very hip though. Once once he saw that I was into it and that I was going to be practicing, he uh, he had me study with one of his best friends. Uh, a wonderful, natural jazz tenor player named Frank Corby. And Frank's one of those guys who sort of never left that little part of Ohio, but he was a great player. The nice thing about that, too, is like when Frank was in his 70s uh, and up until his early 80s, every time that I would go down to North Carolina to visit my mom and dad, which was frequently, uh, I usually flew into Raleigh, and often I would go hang with Frank and and then we would end up uh, playing he would put together these little sessions and so I started off when I was like 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 studying with him and playing with him and then in my 50s and his 70s and 80s we played together again you know it was sort of a beautiful little circle oh that's great Uh, did did um, did you had siblings right yeah, I have a brother who's a master carpenter and uh, and and director in the theater down in Philadelphia, and uh, and my sister uh, is married and lives in uh, North Carolina in Raleigh. So I see I used to see her more frequently, but still see her often. Right, but so you were the one that kind of got the gift from your father. Yeah, although my sister was very talented musically too, and she was a good flute player, but. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that characterizes all of us is that uh, we started playing and and fell in love with it, and and so the fire got lit. And and when you have that, you know, it's it's. I think it's imp- probably impossible to talk you out of music. Although you know, it's a funny thing. Like, there's a couple of guys here in New York. Uh, uh, there was a great alto player named Andy Marsala. There's a wonderful right. thing on YouTube of Cannonball Adderley and Andy when Andy was like 16 years old. And Andy starts playing, and you can see Cannonball is sort of startled, you know. He was s- such a great player. But then uh, he, he, I don't know whether it was the, uh, the biz or the music biz or whatever, but he just walked away from it, man. Great, great player, great improviser. Wow. And, uh, turned his back on the music business so so that happens but i think that you are a perfect example of what we're what i'm talking about you know you never thought of doing anything else did you no i mean you know i went through a basketball phase but i was still playing gigs every four days you know even when i was young so no i uh, i i realized that uh this white guy could only jump until he was 37 (laughs) (laughs) anyway uh, hey do you remember what the very first record that caught that that lit your fire when you were a kid well you know dad was playing music all the time so i'm not sure what the very first record was but uh you know i i certainly heard a lot of uh, woody herman and stan kenton and and cal basie and uh and stan getz and uh, but my dad was, you know, he was real open and listening to all kinds of stuff. So I know what I can remember albums that made a stunning impact on me, though. Uh, yeah. When I was in my late teens, uh, when I heard Sketches of Spain, uh, it just sort of blew my mind. And and another record from that time that that really got me and, and I think has influenced my writing and playing probably was that Thelonious Monk, uh, live at Town Hall, album that uh, that uh, what's his name, Overton, did the arrangement. Much music, 
and uh, Phil Woods was on it, and Thad Jones, and right. all kinds of great, great album. I, the, the tunes and uh, the orchestrations that Paul did, that which were so true to Monk's way of voicing. I, 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 my mind and between you know Gil Evans and Monk uh, that's when I first saw that there was uh, more to jazz than, uh, than the standard big band stuff that I had listened to when I was a kid right hey hey, uh, hold that thought we will be right back with the great Lou Marini run with the big dogs the experts at pitbull audio have the gear to get you into the game from leading manufacturers like mesa boogie fender pioneer and american audio to sound your best you need the best pitbull audio can deliver in rehearsal on stage and into the big time dropping beats shredding guitar or making the crowd roar whatever you dream pitbull audio can help make it happen we are pitbull audio we want you to play it loud pitbullaudio.com Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Have you ever wondered what it's like to record on a Grammy award-winning album? Have you ever wondered what it's like to play in front of a stadium crowd? Have you ever wondered what it's like to be on a world tour? I'm Jackie Bertoni, and I've played with the who's who in the music industry, and I've toured the world. Come join my world behind the velvet rope and get into the groove on Jackie's Groove. Live 2 p.m. Mondays and available 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Great Lou Marini, and I had to go. I had to go there. <laughs> you know, you don't know how hard I worked on that line, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, but you, you delivered it, man. You delivered it. <laughs> well, the good thing about the Blues Brothers movie was that we were playing ourselves. So the uh, if you, if you were conscious, you could act. You know, basically. <laughs> Although you know, Alan Rubin. Uh, was so good as the Mater D that uh, Bernie Brillstein, who produced the movie, he he wanted Alan to stay in Los Angeles, and uh, he was gonna he promised he would get Alan work, but uh, wow. Alan was a committed studio cat, and he he spurned the offer. But uh, I think he later regretted it. Actually, it would have been, oh, he was good. He was uh, a natural. <laughs> well, let's see. we'll we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, you heard. Uh, I'm kind of backtracking here. Uh, the great Count Basie's big band orchestra at, at a young age of 11. Why don't you tell us about what, how that impacted you? Well, my dad took me up. There used to be a, in Canton, Ohio, where the Pro Football Hall of Fame now is, there used to be a, a park that, where bands would play called Myers Lake Park. It was an amusement park and on the lake, of course, in Canton. And, uh, you know, we went to hear Count Basie's band and, course i was knocked but the thing that really got me was they played uh, 
wee small hours of the morning. And mm-hmm. at the end of the chart, when when they, uh, those last phrases get repeated three times, you know, right. and, and they, they were so soft, and, and I was standing right at the edge of the stage. And then suddenly one rim shot and triple F. And, and uh, you know, I remember my memory of it is, is like that, uh, that speaker ad where the guy is sitting in the chair and his hair is blowing straight back. You know, that's, yeah, the, that's the impact yeah. it had on me. And, you know, I'll tell you, man, that makes me think of something. And that is that uh, the impact of acoustic music when it goes from real piano to real triple forte in real life is much more visceral and much more powerful than than electronics ever is you know there's something about it it's just like thrilling thrilling uh my my buddy that i was talking about joe randazzo told me that he was just in verona italy and he heard uh he heard uh, uh an outdoor performance in the roman arena of uh carmen and uh no no amplification with a big orchestra and great singers, he said it was unbelievable. He was he, he was he couldn't he couldn't stop talking about it. He just raved about it, you know. Acoustic. That's how that's how we that's how we learned to play. And you know, it seems like you know the way the industry has totally changed between the eighties and nineties, and now, you know, we've been forced to, to to play forte all the time. You know, forte is the new piano. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, and also the the thing of of uh, the intimacy of when you're playing together, where you're close enough to to read each other's facial expressions and and sense the physical effort that's going on, there's a there's a connectedness that happens when you're playing like that that doesn't happen in any in any other way. You know, we just did a new Blues Brothers album. I produced it, and uh, and we we. We did it live in the studio, a big studio, and right across the river in, in Weehawken, or Hoboken, rather. Right. And uh, uh, a big old studio that had high ceiling, and and uh, every tune is only one or two takes, and it's all live. There's no overdubs on the thing. It really nice. sounds great, man. It's like, it's so organic feeling, you know. It's such a delight to play that way. Can't wait for yeah. it to come out. When, 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 is, when is that going to drop, you think? Uh, we're hoping to have it out by November, so uh, we're we're just putting the last touches on it and see what happens. Excellent. You know, nowadays with with the way that business is, it seems like CDs are almost like sort of an upscale business card. You know, I mean, the only place you sell them is on the gigs. Do people actually? I mean, that's exactly right. You don't you don't make any money on downloads. It's it's like it's it's ridiculous. You know. No. Um, I, I, I can attribute that w- with a personal situation. So yes, I, I, I know that very well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, going through, you know, junior high and high school and have, having your dad, uh, you know, Lou Sr., kind of be your mentor. And did you learn all the reads at that point or w- when you got to North Texas State? No, by the time I got to North Texas, I was already playing everything. Uh, not well. I was playing clarinet really well and saxophones pretty well, and I was getting starting to get there on the flute. But uh, you know, I, when I first went to school, uh, when I would go to sessions, I took the clarinet with me because that was my first instrument, and that's what I felt really confident on. You know, and uh, right. and guys would say, "What are you playing clarinet for? Play the saxophone." You know, so gradually, uh, the clarinet, you know, it, the clarinet is is the hardest action so it's the most demanding and if you don't stay with it uh it it can just betray you in an instant you know i was real happy because yeah. we we did 62 concerts with james taylor this summer and uh there was Dang. one tune that i had a, a nice clarinet part on it and uh and I never missed it, not once. I, I made it through clean, 62 concerts. And, you know, it, it wasn't like a difficult, real difficult part. But the thing about the clarinet is it, anytime you're playing an exposed part, just the, the slightest miss of your fingers or or lapse in concentration, and you can have a squeak or a, 
or a flop note, you know, it's it's so much more uh, dangerous than the other axes, you know, it's so much more unforgiving. But uh, man, I used to love to play a clarinet, and the clarinet to me as a wind player has the most satisfying blow, you know, the re- the physical resistance right. of playing the, the clarinet and the feeling of control over the airstream in the instrument is is real you can feel a real precision to it maybe that's also because that was my first accent for the first four or five years that's all i played but um, you know when i was 13 i was playing in a little uh band that played like italian weddings and and uh you know receptions in the church basement and all that kind of stuff in canton canton was real ethnically mixed it was that part of ohio had a lot of poles and germans and irish and you know all kinds of stuff Right. Um, so, so, what made you? I mean, I mean, coming from the Midwest, what made you not like go to IU uh, and you, you, you choosing North Texas? Uh, uh, when I was uh, fifteen, I went to the first Stan Kenton Jazz Clinics. Uh, back right. in March, I was in uh, Japan with John Tropez Band and uh, Steve Gadd and Randy Brecker. And Randy and I were talking, and we realized that it was fifty years ago that we were. He was there too, and he. We remember each other. And David Sanborn and I were roommates, and uh, wow. so David and I have known each other since we're fifteen. You know, and uh, the North Texas State Band was there, and Don Jacoby was uh, also there as a trumpet teacher. And and you know, I think to this day, it's funny how when you think back, how certain people or certain things impact you. The North Texas band was just, it just sounded great, you know. And I was thinking about going to Berkeley. And uh, right. also, I was a National Merit Scholar, and I had gotten a, a scholarship offer from Brown University to study history. And so there were some different things going on. But I heard the North Texas State Band, and uh, and then I heard Jake do a clinic. And I think right. to this day, that clinic that he did was probably the most impactful moment of my musical life up to that point you know well i mean maybe maybe ever and and he just he was great and he was so inspirational you know and funny and and then later on in texas uh i started working six nights a week with him and i he became like a sort of surrogate father in a way I, i spent a lot of time with him and his family and uh and we had so many hilarious adventures on that band man uh you know, one time we had been playing the Diamonds, and they had this zany madcap act, and you know that was a little darling and all those tunes. Yeah, <laughs> that you know that shit. Well, they left. Uh, right, right, right. This, they they used this uh, this kind of foam spray to make uh, cr- like a cream pie, you know. And Jake yeah. used to do uh, uh, Bunny Barrigans can't get started. And he would do like a whole, like a little mini show after the act that we had just played. And sometimes it used to drive us nuts because we finished this, the main act. And now we're still up there another half hour later playing, you know. So one night the bass player and I took uh, pie pants full of this stuff. And, and as Jake was talking, we pied him, you know, from behind. And oh, we didn't realize how much of, uh, it was. It totally covered his face. So he blew out his, you know, from his lips and his nose and then wipes them out of his eyes and proceeds to play Can't Get Started with all the foam on his face and bro, but just brought the house down. You know, it's fantastic. Oh my God. Hey, uh, Lou, hold that thought. We'll be back with the great Lou Marini and some more shenanigans. Are you serious about this? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. 
Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Have you ever wondered what it's like to record on a Grammy award-winning album? Have you ever wondered what it's like to play in front of a stadium crowd? Have you ever wondered what it's like to be on a world tour? I'm Jackie Bertoni, and I've played with the who's who in the music industry, and I've toured the world. Come join my world behind the velvet rope and get into the groove on Jackie's Groove. Live 2 p.m. Mondays and available 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. back with the great Lou Marini and uh, you were uh, finishing uh, the story about the uh, pied uh, Jake yeah well uh, under his breath after we pied him he said you're fired and, uh, <laughs> 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 but then he hired us back well yeah well see that's true love man yeah well you know he was like a, he was a great it, when I was 19 I think I started working with him six nights a week so, you know, he was a virtuoso trumpet player, and he had been Les Brown's lead trumpet player. And then the other, the third horn was Bobby Butter Burgess on trombone, who had played lead with Maynard, with Woody, with with Stan Kenton. So that's what I was six nights a week for, for like, three years. Uh, that's what I was playing. That That's who I was playing with, you know, while I was going to school. And the... The lessons about ensemble playing and listening are playing with those guys. There's, there's just no way you can replace an experience like that. You know, it was, it was, uh, it was. I was lucky. You know, I've been lucky, but I've been prepared. I think, although there's plenty. There's been times when I was not prepared. I, I auditioned for Horace Silver one time, and I didn't do my homework, and and uh, was sort of crushed you know and uh but it taught me something you know it taught me hey man you better you can't take things lightly if you want it you better get your shit together and, and learn the music and know what you're doing you know i took it right, too lightly right. i thought it was just being able to improvise but no he wanted you to know his tunes wow yeah uh, big uh big surprise there but you know sometimes you have to have a, a case of the dumbass in order to uh to advance Right. Tell us about the uh, the BS and T audition. Oh, uh, well, that that came about because uh, when I first got to New York, I had done a clinic with Clark Terry, and uh, Clark and I had played together, and and he was really warm to me and really encouraging about being in New York. He said something interesting, you know. He said, you know, New York is full of guys who play good, who are now insurance salesmen or lawyers or doctors. He says because you know if you go to New York, you'll find out if you really want to play or not. And if you really want to play, then that means you got to work on your instrument, you know. But anyway, I went in, and, and Clark uh, played a big band chart of mine and uh, uh, called uh, – it used to be – it's just called Rena now. It's on that Blues Blues CD. And uh, they loved it. And uh, so then they, they sounded me to uh, – 
to come up and audition. And, uh, and, and you know, that the, the funny thing was, I didn't know this, but Joe Henderson had been playing with the band. And, uh, wow. although he never played any gigs, but he was rehearsing and, and, uh, and doing stuff, you know, but, uh, I guess I must have done done okay on the audition because I got the gig. But you know, my 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 coming to New York, I had gotten divorced in Dallas. I decided uh, I had a big band playing every Monday night. My buddy Joe Randazzo again. We were driving home after a gig, you know, and I said, "Man, for two cents, I'd move this, leave this town, and move to New York." And he flipped a couple of pennies up on the dashboard of the car, <laughs> and I was like, "You're right." And so I made the decision to move. I didn't have any bread. Uh, no plan other than to go there, and uh, and then I got a call from from Doc Severinsen. He had just fired my a guy who was I ended up playing in his big band, a guy named Rick Wall, his lead alto player in his little traveling band, and uh, Rich Madison, the, the euphonium yeah. player, had run into Doc at the brass conference in New York, and uh, and recommended me. So so that's the way it. Uh, you know, I came to New York with a gig and sirens. Well, see, that, that's good. And a sight. Well, listen, we, I, I I know you are speaking to us live from New York, and it's it's a beautiful thing. Uh, <laughs> was was what was, was so, Bobby? Uh, my point uh, was, it, it, was I, yeah. it was sort of meant to be. Yeah, Columbia was the was the drummer. Right. Did, did he have a, a say in you know, or was was it a a, a community band? It was a community band, and. Uh, we did the. I did the audition. I played all afternoon, and uh, they said, uh, "Let us have a minute." And uh, they took a minute, and then they came back out and said, "You got the gig." But I remember I told them. I said, "Well, uh, you know, I'm, I, uh, I do like to occasionally inhale some substance, and I don't want to be hiding it. So I'm not going to be uh, pretending around you cats, you know." And, then, and of course, this was 1970 or 71. And uh, right. so I made my little declaration, and it was okay. Those days are long gone, though. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so I mean, so then you you were committed uh, full time now to the band, or, or were you you were veer, veering into the New York recording scene simultaneously? <laughs> simultaneously, because the band went out uh, usually like every weekend or two or three weekends a, a month, and then we did uh, tours of Europe. So. I think I, I think I did two European tours with the band. And the first one was like seven weeks. It was one of the longest tours that a uh, rock band, American band had done up to that time. We had a ball, you know, we were in like 11 countries and, and, uh, it was a lot of fun. I had, uh, sort of mixed feelings about my time with blood, sweat and tears because there was a lot of dissension in the band about the direction that it wanted to go. But, you know, I had like, I had my own tunes on the albums, and uh, and I have arranged others of the tunes, and and uh, but then when I left, I had intended to stay a couple of years. I think I lasted a year and a half. I did two albums, and then I quit because I was having uh, I was getting nodgeda before the gigs, you know, and who needs that? So I split, and uh, and so I, I for a long time I had sort of a negative feeling about the my years with the band, but in the past five or six years. Uh, like I remember about five years ago, Soloff called me up one night and he said, you got to see something. He came by and he had uh, a DVD that had our appearance on, uh, on the first uh, Dick Clark rock and new year's Eve show on the queen Mary. Right. And then some other stuff, uh, uh, live stuff. And, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't seen anything or listened to anything except the records from that time on. I was knocked out, man. I had written a, an arrangement of a tune called I Can't Move No Mountains, and uh, it mm -hmm. was written for two trumpets, soprano and, and trombone, and hard as hell horn parts. Uh, really some difficult stuff to play, and we played it and just killed it. And, it. and and not only that, it was like relaxed, you know, and in the pocket. I was, I was, all of a sudden I got very proud about my, my time in the band, you know, because I realized uh, for whatever things were going on outside playing the concert when we got on stage it was take no prisoners man it was a full-out band so yeah that was that was good 
Well, I've got all the records, but I think, you know, your, your, your greatest, one of your greatest achievements, I mean, you know, this, our, we, we live a long life, so it's always a, a, an achievement to go forward. But when you joined, as they say, the hippest band, uh, Saturday Night Live band, I mean, that must have been just amazing. Yeah, and that was another audition. That was an audition that I, I had a feeling before I even went that this was my gig. And, uh, and then it turned out to be my gig. They had actually hired a, another guy who was a friend uh, of, of Howard Johnson's. And he was a great player, but uh, I think personality-wise and also professional conduct-wise, uh, he, he was driving everybody crazy. And I, I think I came in the third show. But uh, I was working on, there was a lot of New York saxophone players who auditioned for the gig, but I nailed it. And, you know, that was one thing Alan Rubin used to say to me right before the opening theme. He'd say, where's the hippest place to be on earth right now? You know, he'd be like, yeah, right here. That show had so much impact at the time. You know, a friend of mine told me, uh, he said, Lou, you're a little bit, you, you sort of got a Forrest Gump thing happening with the, with the music business because without uh, ever really having a career plan, uh, even thinking about it, you know, I, I was just playing and, and trying to learn. And uh, But, you know, uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears, then to Saturday Night Live, then the Blues Brothers and the Blues Brothers movies. And, uh, you know, I sort of was like in the right place at the right time for a bunch of stuff. And and uh, so there was a, there's a, amount of, there's a, luck, there's a lot of luck involved because, geez, I know you, you know, too, probably great players who can't get arrested you know and it's right. a funny thing but but it's uh it's been non-stop so i'll tell you the greatest thing about it jr is that i've gotten to spend yeah. my life with guys like you with great players oh, my you. whole career and you know what a gift that is man how lucky we are you know well you're in a suit us an unbelievable band of of my peers and friends with james taylor and uh, you know with steve and landau and jimmy and uh and Lu Luis comes Luis is in that band all the time right yeah and larry golding shit oh, it's a great band and, yeah, it's a, yeah it's unbelievable a pleasure, band it. hey uh, uh, uh hold that thought and uh, we'll be more with the great lou marini to run with the big dogs the experts at pitbull audio have the gear to get you into the game from leading manufacturers like mesa boogie fender pioneer and american audio to sound your best you need the best pitbull audio can deliver in rehearsal on stage and into the big time dropping beats shredding guitar or making the crowd roar whatever you dream pitbull audio can help make it happen we are pitbull audio we want you to play it loud pitbullaudio.com Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Have you ever wondered what it's like to record on a Grammy award-winning album? Have you ever wondered what it's like to play in front of a stadium crowd? Have you ever wondered what it's like to be on a world tour? I'm Jackie Bertoni, and I've played with the who's who in the music industry, and I've toured the world. Come join my world behind the velvet rope and get into the groove on Jackie's Groove. Live 2 p.m. Mondays and available 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com.
Civilization Blues by the great Lou Marini. Uh, we were talking about the uh, Saturday Night Live band and uh, the impact of the Blues Brothers, the great James Taylor band. Uh, I think everybody wants to hear one Belushi story, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, and you can go anywhere you want. You know, Belushi, uh, uh, one, one, we were hanging out. Uh, he had, he had a, a nice place. Uh, I forget where it was that he was renting while he was while we were doing the movie and uh, a few of us were over there hanging with him and uh, he had a new sony pro walkman it was the one the big one that used to lay flat and and uh, you Mm -hmm. could record with it It had a nice microphone and not like the handheld one it was a bigger one you know like a small uh deck and so he asked me about it he says uh so you guys like these and and i said uh I, I don't know what you're talking about, you know. And he said, didn't you guys all get a, one of these decks from Sony or from Atlantic, from Atlantic Records? And uh, I said, no, no. And uh, he says, you you got to be kidding. He says, Aykroyd and I got them. And I said, well, you guys are the stars. We didn't get them. He says, wait a minute. Next thing you know, he's on the phone with a guy from Atlantic Records. And uh, the guy is saying, I can hear Belushi saying, why, why don't all the guys in the band have them, you know? And uh, apparently the Atlantic guys said something about, well, with the Stones, we only gave them to to Mick and Keith, you know. And Belushi said, well, this isn't the Stones. He says, if, if everybody doesn't get them, we don't want them. And the guy apparently must have said, well, you can't take them back. And Belushi hung up on him and immediately called <laughs> the actors home in uh, in L.A. and donated the two tape decks to the, to the actors' home. He wouldn't have them. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic, man. What a great cast! He was, oh my he God. was a uh, you know he he had his dark predilections and he had a romantic uh, view of like the dangerous life you know like Lord Byron or or Janis Joplin right. or you know uh, pushing the envelope he always had that part of his personality but he was a charismatic and so insightful man he he was one of those cats that just read you you know and but it, there was something about his fame that uh unlike most stars i think people just glommed him we were in tower records one night about one o'clock in the morning and there was like one person in there besides me and john and my ex-wife and uh and and our road manager who was always bodyguard cat with always with john and but that one person realized that Belushi was there, so he stayed. And then, like, three other people came in, and then they realized he was there, and they stayed. And then, you know, over the course of, like, 15 minutes, all of a sudden there's, like, 40 people, and they're all milling around and, and getting closer and closer to John. And finally they just all glommed him, you know, and he just ran. And I, and I could see how that if your life is like that, where any – person who sees you just doesn't have any hesitation at all about coming right up to you and and you know even though it's affectionate it it would have to just drive you crazy and it it did drive him crazy you could see like almost a panic in his eyes you know it was like oh fuck so yeah he he was uh and you know when he when we found out about him you know that was such a crushing thing man I think everybody remembers where they were. People loved him, you know. They just loved him. Oh, yeah. He was a fantastic. I'll tell you what, too, man. You know, Steve Jordan plays a break on uh, going back to Miami on the Made in America album. And Belushi right. nails his entrance. And it's not an easy break to uh, to hear, you know. Belushi had really good time and, and, uh, and a deadly ear. He was a lot of funny moments with him. One night, uh, one afternoon, he and Tom Scott and Ruben and I were hanging out in his room, and he suggested a tune that we should do. And we said, well, what's the tune? He says, I can't remember it. You know, he says, but I can tell you how it goes. <laughs> and he starts singing it in this rough, guttural voice, and basically he was just sort of singing the rhythm of it. And we were all just baffled by it, you know, sitting around the bed while he's humming this tune. And then suddenly Tom Scott starts laughing. And he says, it's Route 66, because Belushi is going, hum, hum, ding, hum, ding, hum, ding. you know, it's like, it, it, it was just so abstracted. <laughs> but as soon as Tom said it, then we all were like, 
oh yeah you know everybody like yeah snap to it but hilarious man yes well his phrasing uh you know was i mean for, for, for he probably was fairly un, un unmusical but his phrasing was great yeah yeah no he was he was a very natural cat I took him to, uh, I ran into Sharif Khan, the world champion squash player. I had seen him play in New York in the Denver Athletic Club and invited him to the concert. And uh, Sharif showed up with uh, his brother Aziz, or maybe these were cousins, but Aziz, Ghoul, Mo, uh, Jasmine, another cousin. Like there were five or six, and they're all Pakistani from the Khyber Pass, you know. And when when uh, when I brought them backstage, they already had tickets, so I invited them backstage. And uh, I went to introduce them to Belushi, and Belushi immediately says, "Looks like a fucking terrorist group." This <laughs> is <just> opening. <laughs> 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 but they loved well, it. Yeah. And then Sharif said, "Would you like to take a squash lesson?" And we were like, "Yeah." And we went to uh, the next morning. We went to the club and. Uh, and took a squash lesson, each of us individually, from Sharif. And afterwards, Sharif, I had been playing handball in New York and then started playing squash, too. So I knew something about it. But Sharif said to me, he says, man, this guy's a natural, you know. So he's, he's a natural athlete. And uh, and then the next day after the concert, they came to the concert. The next day, Sharif played his father, Hashim. Hashim was six times world champion squash player in his 30s because uh, – of immigration uh, he didn't get to compete you know usually squash players are done by the time they're 30 and uh, and we watched Sharif and Hashim play me and Belush they played a, a three game match and and I, it's the greatest athletic thing I ever saw in my life man. Wow. It, it was unbelievable wow. now, I hadn't thought of that in a while that's a nice memory well, good. Um, and, you know, you have now become a mentor, and you know you were mentored obviously by your father and 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 coming through. But uh, you know, you went to the Stan Kenton camps when you were little, and you know, I met you in 1971 at Illinois State University at National Stage Band camps, and the following year, I believe, is uh, your you were not there, and your father came out. And we're all sitting there, you know, waiting to find out what he was going to say. And he told us that you had just gotten the BS&T gig. And I don't know yeah. if you recall. I mean, it was, uh, you know, you, you signed our picture. <laughs> you were a mentor. You know what's nice, man? You know, it's not. It's, well, there's something nice about that because uh, I have such, uh, you know, I, I still feel like I'm uh, I'm uh, just sitting in the James Taylor band night tonight, you know, just watching and listening to these guys that I'm playing with. I, I oftentimes think, uh, what the hell am I doing there? You know, but, uh, so I, I, I feel like I'm still a perennial student, but it has been a really rewarding thing over the years. Like, uh, you know, Miles Davis was on the Saturday night live show and Bill Evans was right. playing saxophone with him. So I, I walked up to introduce myself to Bill and when I did, Bill was like, wow, Lou, he said, you were my teacher at the National State Band Camps in, in Oregon or somewhere like that. He says, you gave me a mouthpiece and two books of uh, two exercise books to play, you know. So th th that's sort of a nice, uh, I didn't remember it, uh, giving him the mouthpiece or that I remembered him, but I didn't remember that I had given him the stuff. But that's a nice thing. Right. Uh, it, to, it makes you feel good, you know, it's a rewarding thing to uh, to feel like you've given back some well what kind of advice now i mean in today's youth i mean just just music industry is rampant it's it's almost out of control i mean what what would you give advice to the to the youth of today boy you know i don't know it's it's well you know somehow there still are monster players coming along every everywhere you look you know every time i turn around and hear some new saxophone player it just kills me i i i just think that uh you know we're we're supposed to be pure about playing and uh and i i i on the national stage band camps uh, ted dunbar the great bebop guitar player and he played free a lot too we did a concert together one night with John Laporta and I forget who else. And we, we, afterwards we were talking about religion 
and uh, and Ted said church is on the bandstand. And you know that's that's a beautiful way to think about it, isn't it? You know, like whatever you believe, when you get on the bandstand and you're playing and you're communicating and and giving selflessly to the music, that's that's the best feeling. That's what we live. Well, listen, uh, I hate to cut you off here, man, but it's been an honor. The great Lou Marini. You've been listening to Vinyl Night, powered by Intertalk Radio, the groove of the music industry. Are you, you ready can to get me, JR, at VinylNight.com. experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio, to sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beat, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Have you ever wondered what it's like to record on a Grammy award-winning album? Have you ever wondered what it's like to play in front of a stadium crowd? Have you ever wondered what it's like to be on a world tour? I'm Jackie Bertoni, and I've played with the who's who in the music industry, and I've toured the world. Come join my world, Behind the Velvet Rope, and get into the groove on Jackie's Groove. Live 2 p.m. Mondays and available 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com.